All right, so welcome everyone to the uh, live stream. Basically, tonight I just want to talk about, you know, um, my investments, uh, you know, recent stock market, things going on there. And um, if anyone, you know, has any questions, wants to talk about anything in particular, I'd love to hear, um, you know, your opinions on certain things, I guess. Uh, so I see Jonathan's here. If you have any uh, investments you've been looking at recently, Jonathan, I'd love to hear about that. Um, you know, kind of like what are you looking into, stuff like that. Uh, for me, in terms of actual dividend stocks, you know, I think there's really not that many dividend stocks, if I'm being honest, that um, are, you know, compelling to me at these prices. Um, I can pull up my portfolio here and kind of look through the list um, but I think for me some of the best uh, prices right now are probably things like 3m um, I think is at a pretty good price JP Morgan is at a pretty good price store capital um, which is a stock that I own in my Roth IRA uh, it's a REIT and I really enjoy that one um, that one I think is at a fantastic price, like $27 per share. Um, but unfortunately I basically um, used up all my Roth IRA money. So I pretty much have, you know, no cash in there and I contribute everything, contributed everything for uh, 2022 already. So can't really buy any more store capital um, for a, uh, for you know six months I guess until 2023 hits um, I can buy some on drips I think I think they probably pay out maybe in July or August I'm not even sure to be honest um, but I probably drip like one share every time I looking more at value for longer like pool so I'm not really familiar with that company I've definitely heard of it um, but I'm not I definitely would say I don't know what they do. So let me look them up a little bit and we'll see what I think. Uh, I guess what what is uh, attractive to you about pool, Jonathan? Uh, like what's, what's the value proposition for you, I guess? Um, let's see what they do. I'm not really sure what they do, to be honest. Um, so in terms of drips, uh, Jonathan asked if I always drip. Basically, um, for most of my dividend stocks, I don't drip um, just because, you know, the dividends are still pretty small at this point. So um, it just doesn't seem very worth it to me. And um, I feel like if I, you know, consolidate some of the money from dividends, um, then I can kind of, you know, allocate it more efficiently, I guess. Um, just by basically adding it to my cash balance uh, where I do drip is in my Roth IRA um, so I own a few dividend stocks basically the only dividend stocks I own in my Roth IRA are REITs um, like uh, store capital and realty income so I drip those and I think I get maybe around 0.1 shares of realty income every drip every every month basically and then I probably get um, around a share of store capital every payout which is three months and um, and then I also drip like the ETFs or mutual funds that I own which is basically just VTI and VOO um, I drip those as well uh, just because you know why not um, I guess I could like take the dividends in cash and use it to buy some other companies but it's not really um, Again, they're not going to be super substantial that are going to allow me to, you know, buy large amounts of other companies. So um, that's kind of my thoughts on the drip. Um, I think it's definitely a powerful tool if you want to be pretty hands off and uh, not want to do a whole lot there. But uh, at least for me, for most of my companies, 
uh, my allocation is just pretty small so it's not really it just doesn't really make sense because you know if I make a dollar in dividends from a company that's gonna buy like 0 0.01 shares if that you know so it just doesn't seem very significant so I'd rather just kind of accumulate the cash over time and buy a little bit larger chunks um, it just makes more sense to me so it looks to me looking at this company that let's see pool so they sell like chemicals pool supplies stuff like that are currently valued around 16 billion dollars um and looks like they beat earnings like pretty consistently which is kind of a good sign to see and uh we can look at the financials i'll try to check that out Um, so right off the bat, they're growing revenues pretty, uh, nicely, which I like to see. Um, and they are, mm, in general, they're sort of decreasing shares outstanding, buying back some shares, which is good, growing net income. So generally the financials look decent. Um, you know, they're growing, which is good to see, but. I would have to look more into it. Uh, I guess the other thing I wanted to mention was like Amazon. Um, I think at this point is pretty interesting because of the stock split. Um, I think a lot of people at this point have access to fractional shares, but definitely not everyone. So it definitely opens up, opens it up um, to more people. I think, you know, accessibility wise, I guess for Amazon. So I think in general, that's a good thing. Um, but, you know, it's not really going to change anything for me, I guess, is my point. Um, I think that, I think oftentimes, like, splits can rally a company a little bit in the short term. But, you know, in the long term, it's uh, not really that big of a deal. Um, you said you'd buy Google over Amazon. I think I'd agree with that, um, buying Google over Amazon. Uh, I think Google... I think Google's probably, I would probably say it's at a little bit of a better price than Amazon right now. Um, so I think I'd agree there that I would buy it at this point uh, over Amazon. I definitely, um, I really like Microsoft as well, but, you know, I it's not really a, that great of a price. Um, and I think, you know, something like maybe... Google is at a little bit of a better price at this point. Um, honestly, like PayPal, I think PayPal is a great company. Um, and they, you know, obviously have a lot of potential in the um, digital payments. And right now they've just been like absolutely destroyed, like down probably like 70%, at least from their highs, um, which is fairly substantial, I would say. So. Uh, PayPal, I guess, is one that I really like at these prices, and I definitely don't, um, I'm not really buying it much, but I am, um, I do own it in my M1 Finance account, and so I have been, you know, buying it some there, as, uh, basically as M1 Finance does for me, and so I'm certainly happy to lower my average cost for sure, like, 80 70 90 bucks a share for paypal like i will take that for sure um so i would say i like paypal um i think i like square too at these prices for sure it's a little bit it's definitely a little bit less proven um but i think it's still a good company and they're i personally think they'll succeed in the long term for sure um it's just a just a matter of time and proving them proving themselves a little bit Yes, uh, PayPal does own Venmo, and they're kind of like, honestly, they're like pretty similar platforms at this point. Um, I think the thing that Venmo has, it's a little bit more, uh, I guess they're like UI is better, I would say, and it's just like easier to use peer-to-peer, um, -peer, I guess, a little bit more, whereas PayPal is better for like secure, secure payments online um, to some degree. 
I know like I always try to like use PayPal when I'm shopping online whenever possible. Um, so I think that's more where PayPal's value is right now, but uh, Venmo is more like a peer-to-peer -peer thing that's popular, but you can also use uh, Venmo for like a business as well, which is definitely, uh, definitely, you know, an advantage as well. But, and you know, you can use PayPal peer-to-peer. -peer. It's just like, doesn't seem quite as convenient, I guess. Um, at least that's my uh, understanding or that's my like perception per se, if that makes sense. So I'm actually looking at pool right now and yeah, I would agree. Like, I think it's a pretty decent valuation. Well, not necessarily a decent valuation, but um, technically speaking, it's looks uh, very beaten down and um be interesting to see what happens obviously i don't know much about their actual business and financials but i think it looks pretty decent it has like uh it has some pretty good volume here which is definitely good to see uh mastercard yeah uh mastercard is interesting to be honest i own both mastercard and visa um you know, I think they're both very similar in what they do, but uh, I don't know. I don't think it really hurts to own both of them. And for the most part, they're both doing the same things. But at some point, I guess one could uh, do better than the other. I guess it's just hard to tell at this point. So that's kind of where I'm at with those. Um, I think the... The other thing I've been thinking a lot about recently, I guess, is just options. Um, obviously, I've done some options trading and uh, with varying levels of success, I guess. Like the first year was fairly successful and then I just kind of had some problems from there um, where my strategies were starting to get tested more um, and I had to adapt a little bit and struggle a little bit and learn. Um, and at this point, you know, it's just something that I don't think um, for me at this point is like super uh, helpful thing to be doing. Uh, mainly, I guess, it's just because the capital required just is like too much. And for my account size, like my options account is around four or five thousand dollars. And I think a lot of times it just works better and you're able to be more diversified have a larger account at least like 10 20 thirty thousand dollars works a lot better i think so i think at some point i'll probably pull most of that money out of my options account or just invest more in long-term things in that account um and just wait sort of until i'm more ready i guess to uh, put more into that and invest more into options which i think long term it's like a great strategy um in order to basically, where I see the value, I guess, is where you have the capital to buy 100 shares of a company, and then you can just sell puts at whatever price you want to own that company at and get paid premium. So that's sort of where I see the big value with options, is you can sort of choose the price you want to buy the company at and just kind of wait, um, essentially, until you get to that price or closer to that price, and you know, you're getting paid premiums for waiting. Um, but there's definitely, I would say there's definitely compounding because you can take whatever profits you make and even either sell more contracts or start um, selling more options on different companies, I guess. And there, there's definitely a compounding effect. I mean, you're in a sense, there's almost like more compounding there than just like straight up buying stock because you're realizing small gains. Theoretically, you're realizing small gains along the way and you can reinvest those more frequently almost. Um, whereas generally speaking, you're when you're investing in stock, you're letting the company and the managers of the company do the compounding a little bit. Yeah, and like Bill said, uh, covered calls is a good way as well. Um, once you're, if you eventually um 
accumulate those 100 shares of a company selling covered calls is a good strategy um i was kind of with store capital which is store capital i would say is um definitely one of my favorite reits especially at these prices it's like fantastic but i was accumulating shares and i'm um, getting close to 100 shares so i just said i'll get to 100 shares so i bought the rest and then i was going to start selling covered calls um the main problem there is store capital just isn't as large of a company and it's not very popular for options so um there's really not much premium there and at least right now the price is like two three bucks below my average cost so um i'm having to you know just wait like there's there's really no point in selling calls at this price because i'll get paid like one or two dollars maybe if that um so i guess that is the downside with some companies some some of the more boring companies i guess they just don't have as much interest in the options so the prices are lower and it's hard to get fills and stuff like that but in general yeah covered calls is a good thing um i think eventually once i get to 100 shares of realty income i'll probably do that and you know probably for my regular dividend portfolio it'll be a while many years before i get to 100 shares of many companies just because i um just because I'm adding money pretty slowly there. And I would say, you know, some rates are pretty high right now, but like the one I was talking about just now, store capital, they're like at 52 week lows, like multi year lows for sure. Um, I would guess that they're at lows since basically their lows since the 2020 crash. And uh, before that, I'm not sure the last time they were that low, but um, like they were down in the 26s, maybe the 25s at some point. I'm not sure. Um, I think I bought most of my shares in the like 30 to $35 range. So I'm definitely, definitely, um, down a little bit on my shares, but you know, it's not that big of a deal for me. Store Capital is a great company and, uh, more than happy to hold it long-term. I mean, obviously it really got hit hard during the pandemic. Like they went down all the way to $15 per share at the bottom. Like that would have been so awesome to buy a store there. But um, unfortunately, I don't even think I probably didn't even know about the company at that point. Um, and uh, Realty Income is a is another good one that I like. Um, but I it's not at the best prices right now. I would say, you know, in the, I think it's in the high 60s right now, um, which I like it better in the low 60s um, so it looks like it's like 67 so I definitely like it in the lower 60s a bit more and that's where I bought most of my shares was you know low 60s or below 60 um, it's a pretty good price so overall you know I think I'm happy with the the REITs in my portfolio I mean if you just look if you're just looking at dividend stocks like probably 90% of my portfolio, well, maybe not 90%, but a lot of my portfolio would be in REITs, but um, I guess I'll say like, because of the fact that I own REITs in my Roth IRA, I'm sort of uh, buy a lot more of them so that they're a substantial portion of my Roth IRA. But honestly, I don't really know much about many REITs. Um, I know MPW, is a popular one which is like a medical REIT I think medical properties trust um, so let me look at that one. Oh wow they had some very red months like the past two months that's very interesting uh, let's see For some reason my computer is being super slow right now maybe it's just because of the stream I'm not sure but um, looks like Wow, yeah. They're fairly close to like 2020 lows, which is pretty crazy. It's at like $17, yeah. I think this is actually a decent level. There might be a little bit of support right around this level right here, to be honest. Um, so, wow, I think that company is at a great valuation, actually. That is a That looks very nice. Um, but that, that's a good suggestion, Bill. Um, might have to look into that. MPW for like options of some sort because just to see what's out there. I don't know. In terms of target, 
Oh, I know this IIPR is popular. I honestly don't know much about it either. Innovative industrial properties. Uh, I guess it's like an industrial REIT of some sort. I honestly don't really know what they do that much. I would say one of my problems, I guess I struggle with is like the companies I'm not invested in, I don't know that much about. So then if there's like a good opportunity on it, I'm like not as educated. And so I'm not like sure if it's a company I want to be invested in. So I sort of need to like be broadening my horizons and doing research on other companies, which I guess is partly what I do on my YouTube channel a little bit is do some research on some other companies that I'm not as familiar with. Um, but in general, uh, I don't, you know, do as much research on companies I don't own. So that's sort of a struggle, I guess. Uh, target. Um, that's another one I definitely don't know as much about um, in terms of the company. I know they had like disappointing earnings that uh, caused them to drop a lot here down into the 150s, uh, which is pretty interesting. Let's see what they look like. The PE ratio right now is 13, forward PE of 12, which is very attractive. Um, at these prices for sure. Um, their uh, EPS is expected to be growing a lot. Their EPS over the past five years has grown like 25% on average, which is uh, great to be honest over the past five years. Um, that's very strong actually. And um, let's see here. I mean, I guess they're really not, they're not even to pre-pandemic highs, to be honest. Um, but a very large drop there. And there might actually be like a little bit of a support, a little bit of support, excuse me, right around the 145. So I guess like the current price could be nice. Um, I definitely have to look into the financials a little bit more because I don't really know about the. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, IPR is a marijuana re. Yeah, I definitely. There was definitely one of the reads that I knew was like into, uh, the cannabis industry. I didn't know which one it was, but that's interesting. Interesting. I guess that that's what they mean by innovative. <laughs> that's actually a little bit funny. Yeah, that's definitely like something I would like to do is just do more research on companies I don't know about because um, it's just a good way to get more educated and uh, more aware of what opportunities are out there because I think there's always going to be like some opportunities somewhere in the stock market. Sometimes there's going to be a lot more opportunities than others and you just got to look at where they're at um, and be aware of what's out there, you know? So that's something I'm kind of trying to improve upon. And uh, I think it's definitely, you know, obviously it's a long game and I'm generally speaking fairly new to investing. So I have plenty of time, but you know, the beginning is mathematically, the beginning is what counts the most. Um, so they do target, I like the uh, dividend growth rate and they have a very low payout ratio, which is good to see as well. So. Excuse me. Uh, they've been growing. They grow the dividend about eight and a half percent a year, which is pretty good, to be honest. Oh, uh, this VICI. I've heard about this one too. I don't even know what they do either, to be honest. Um, yeah, I'm not even sure what they do. I think it might be like a, like a something to do with Vegas, maybe. But uh, the, they're pretty much at like all time highs right now though. So that's not like the best time to be buying in most cases. Um, <laughs> that's kind of what I see right off the bat. It's kind of at all time highs, but um, you know, if they got down, you know, 25, definitely below 30, I'd be more interested, I think. But 
P ratio, well, P ratio doesn't really matter for rates. It's like 19, but um, that's not that big of a deal. I wonder what the dividend looks like because um, at least a lot of people like look at REITs for dividends. Obviously, they pay out 90% of their taxable income. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, they're yielding 4.5%, so that's pretty good. I guess with BICI, I would think I would like to see more um, dividend growth. Kind of see that they're at least a little bit committed to that because it looks to me like they haven't really grown the dividend that much. Well, I guess they've grown it a little bit, but uh, I guess they've grown it a decent amount. Okay, Seeking Alpha was saying they, they didn't have a value for past five years dividend growth, but that's because they haven't been paying the dividend for five years, so that makes sense to me. Going to casinos. What about INVH? I've heard of that one as well, but again, don't really know what it was about. Invitation homes. So maybe that's like nursing homes type thing, something like that. I'm not sure. Again, like that one just doesn't look like the best valuation at this point for me. Um, and so that's like, even if it's a great company, I wouldn't want to buy it at like a super high price. Um, there's definitely different uh, strategies for sure, like in terms of when you buy a company. Costco is also a great company. Um, again, not one that I know a lot about. I know they like increased the price of their hot dogs recently or something, which was like a big deal. Um, but they've been really tanking the last few weeks, few months, but still not a good enough price for Jonathan. I think definitely from a chart like the three i mean close to 300 looks great but like 380 380 looks pretty good to me um, in terms of a chart technical um, indicator 32 though um 30 oh 37 pe which is not that great and they're not i mean their earnings grow grew 16 percent on average the last few years but that's still not like I don't think that's really enough to justify a 36 PE, you know? So that's something that would be a little bit concerning for me, I guess, is the PE there at 36, 37. Um, but uh, PE ratio is certainly not everything. Um, if we look at Amazon, I think their PE ratio is kind of high right now as well. So hmm, maybe not. I think some of these numbers might not be right because of the split. So it says here that their PE is 3, but their forward PE is 45. So I'm not sure. I think they just uh, don't have the numbers quite right because of the split. Not sure though. But I mean, again, Amazon really hit hard the past few months in terms of the stock price. Um, they definitely recovered a little bit, but um, I think I was looking at a chart for Amazon, I don't know, within the past few days, and I think like around the 110, 108 level is definitely a lot better uh, in terms of a technical analysis, looking at a chart a little bit, I think around 108 looks a lot better than right now, um, but you know, I think Amazon is a pretty good company so it's not like uh, not like that would be a bad investment by any stretch of the imagination um, so is there anything else you guys are looking at right now um, I think for me if we look at my portfolio let's see what am I looking at um, I would like to buy more Caterpillar but it's not at that great of a price I actually just announced a dividend increase for Caterpillar um, but, uh, you know, it's it was around 8.5%. I think they're, maybe it's just 8%. Their average dividend growth is around 7.5%, so definitely a good thing. Um, I mean, the hot dog thing, you know, I mean, I'm sure they've been losing money on those hot dogs for years, to be honest. But uh, with Costco, I think 
it's just come to a point where they don't want to lose as much money. And um, I think like a value store like Dollar General might actually suffer because they can't make as much money with like actually just selling things for a dollar so they have to raise their prices, you know? So it's not, um, as a consumer, if you go into Dollar General and nothing's like just a buck or two, it's all like ten, twenty dollars that's like not the best image I guess to have that name of Dollar General. So I don't know. But I don't know about I don't think I've done any research really into Dollar General, so I can't really say, I guess. But I think there are, are a lot of companies right now that um, have the I guess potential to do well, but I think they also there's a decent chance that they will struggle over the next few years because of inflation and um, from what I'm hearing at least I don't think supply chain issues are really going away anytime soon um, I guess JP Morgan right now for me I really like it at a uh, current price it's around $130 per share it was definitely it was below 120 at some point over the past few weeks maybe month but um yeah, I think JP Morgan's at a pretty nice price right now. Um, obviously, I liked it better around 100. I think that's where I first bought JP Morgan was around $100 per share. Um, so when I bought it in October, it was like $100. October of 2020. Wow, that was a while ago. October of 2020 when I bought JP Morgan, that was like $100 per share. And then I bought some at 125 I bought some at 152 which is... Not sure why I did that, but then I've been buying it on the way down as well. And um, buying more, you know, 140s, 130s, 129, 128, 123. That was probably my lowest buy. Oh, I bought some at 116. Wow. That, so, yeah, definitely below 120 on JP Morgan was really exciting for me. Um, I definitely would like them like to see them moving towards fintech a little bit more quickly but um i think that you know it's a big company and it's hard to make those pivots as a big company to kind of move towards the fintech stuff more yeah i think um i think there's a decent chance that we kind of just bounce around in the stock market for a little bit and not really go much of anywhere for a while i guess but I think there's, I definitely think there's a chance we see some, some more red and some more drops as um, more earnings come out, um, you know, more inflation data, more jobs data, stuff like that. Um, I think, you know, generally I don't pay attention as much to um, macroeconomic factors, but I think in a time like this, um, where there's kind of, you know, tension, there's a lot of, there's certainly a lot of uncertainty regarding um, the overall economic um, health of the economy really um, I think you know some more macroeconomic factors like inflation rate hikes stuff like that can have a big effect on the economy and the fact that the Fed is you know tightening the balance sheet they're essentially selling assets off their balance sheets uh, means whatever effect they had on propping up the market is starting to go away at least to some degree um, you know, basically the Fed has, I think um, their balance sheet was around one and a half trillion, like in 2008 before that crisis. And now it's like nine trillion. So obviously um, it hasn't all come in the past few years, but it's uh, really been building up over a long time, you know, the past 10 years. Um, yeah, I think jobs numbers aren't that bad. Like, uh, but in general, there's like a lot of jobs available. So I think... I think those numbers should be like going down unemployment numbers, I think should be going down more quickly just because of how many jobs it seems like there are available. Um, but I don't know. It's all a, uh, it's all a long game in terms of that. And you know, all those problems aren't going to be fixed immediately. Um, so it's not like a, uh, not like a, immediate thing that can be fixed with really anything um, in the economy you know it's a big ship it takes 
takes a while to pivot, to be honest. Um, so I think that's that's something that's going to take a while, like the uh, job stuff. Um, I think the job stuff could go down more quickly in employment numbers. Uh, but I think also, you know, inflation. Inflation is definitely uh, more of a challenge than some people in the federal uh, bank thought it would be, Federal Reserve. Um, but, you know, everyone makes mistakes and um, they're just trying to do the best they can. And, you know, they wouldn't, they couldn't have foreseen like the Russia thing. That's could definitely have some effect on some inflationary supply chain issues. Um, so, you know, like no one could have ever foreseen that and predicted that. So uh, they wouldn't know about that. And they definitely probably couldn't have predicted predicted other supply chain issues you know so i think overall they're doing their best and you know the, the u.s economy the global economy they're incredibly complex things you know so uh, it's hard very hard to um, figure out you know what are the causes and what can we do to help it out you know and uh when should we step back and do less? When should we step in and help out and do more? And so those are all like very complex issues. So I think it's um, it's not very, uh, I think it's very humbling to realize this is a complex issue. And I think it's very ignorant to, th you know, think that to just like say all these people did all this stuff wrong and, um, you know, they should have seen this coming, they should have seen that coming, um, because it is a lot, it is a lot to digest, you know, all those factors, um, and I mean, there's certainly some people that predicted, uh, some of those things, like inflation, uh, being a lot worse than some people might have imagined, I think there's a lot of people that predicted that, but same time there's probably a lot of people that didn't, didn't think it was going to be an issue either so it's really uh like i said it's it's complex and so uh, you know it's hard to do i think a co another company that's at a pretty good price right now is like and plat um or you know under 40 dollars per share i think when they were closer to you know 35 36 was even better price um and i was definitely buying a lot you know, the, between 35 and 40 range, um, I've been buying. So I think that Leggett and Platt's at a pretty good price. Uh, I don't want to buy that much more right now. And my main reasoning for that, uh, I guess for context, Leggett and Platt is, let's see, it's about 6.7% of my portfolio right now, which is a fairly substantial portion, um, if you think about it. And the thing... Um, with them is just their dividend growth, you know, is not really there all that much. They have a pretty nice yield around four and a half percent, um, which is awesome to see, excuse me, but you know, their dividend growth is just not that much. Um, I would definitely like to see more out of them, but you definitely can't, uh, expect, you know, a higher dividend yield like that and having you know, better dividend growth as well. So, um, it's definitely a trade off for sure, but, um, I think that they're a solid company, solid company, sorry. And, um, if they're, as long as they're growing the dividend a little bit, I'm happy with that for sure. Um, in terms of what I'm buying, I guess, with the dip, I'm just kind of continuing, uh, with what I'm doing. Basically, I haven't really been buying any ETFs on this dip because, Pretty much the only ETFs I buy are in my Roth IRA. And like I said, I pretty much maxed that out at the beginning of May. And so I don't have any cash left in there to buy, um, which obviously I would love to do that. But uh, it's already maxed out there. So I really can't um, be buying anymore. Sorry. And uh, so not really any ETFs. Like I said, been buying some dividend stocks, but not a crazy amount for sure. Um, definitely like it and Platt, JP Morgan. Uh, I bought some Microsoft recently. It's not like, you know, at a fantastic price, but, um, like I've said before, it's a company that I really want to own. And so 
if I want to own the company, I have to buy it at some point, even if it's not at the best price. Um, so that's just something you have to live with. Uh, I bought some Cisco recently. They had like a, I don't even know if their earnings were necessarily bad, but they basically just tanked. Um, I think they're, I think they still had growing revenue and earnings, but maybe there was just like below expectations or something like that. Um, I forget to be honest, but, um, yeah, so they, they beat analyst expectations by a little bit, um, for their Q2 2022 earnings, but, uh, I'm not sure. I forget exactly what happened there. Um, let's see. I think it was their, maybe their guidance. Um, that was a little bit lower than expected, which is kind of why uh, some people basically were not too happy by that. And their revenue uh, missed estimates as well. So um, I think they are definitely um, a good company and um, I'm kind of looking at an article right now that's talking about the last earnings and basically they mentioned the software and they're definitely trying to shift more towards software and services. And basically right now, um, subscription software revenue currently accounts for 40, 44% of revenue. And by 2025, they expect that to be 50%, um, which is really awesome. And I think that they can, um, really capitalize on that. Um, so, you know, obviously corporate networks, I guess, um, you know, their routers and network, network capabilities. I'm talking about Cisco, uh, the, you know, technology company, CISCO. Um, so I think that, you know, the technology companies or sorry, the, the routers and, you know, data networks in offices, for example, they have a lot of business there think that stuff, which is kind of something that this article is talking about right now, is that um, they're basically um, some of those uh, revenues are declining, or at least spending from companies is declining on that because of the pandemic, and there's less need for that in the office. Um, but I almost feel like uh, companies will either you know subsidize that for employees in their own homes if you know people are working in uh, from home or maybe get them equip the equipment they need in at their own home um so i don't know uh I, obviously they have webex which definitely isn't um most people i would say would agree that it's not like as powerful and i would say it's probably not as popular as um you know it's other uh, platforms like Zoom or Microsoft Teams, but um, they are definitely trying to build that up as a software offering and uh, make it more popular. Um, they're definitely having, I think they have potential with, you know, 5G building out the hardware for that. Um, I don't think they've really gotten into that much, but I think they are supposedly supposed to partner with Dish um, to sell those services and hardware to, um, you know, bigger companies, I think, uh, they're, um, obviously it's kind of interesting to look at their stock because they basically have not ever, um, reached the highs that they were at in like 2000 or something. Um, a lot of times it's hard to look, even look at a chart that's, that, um, includes that much history, but yeah, they have not recovered since like 2000 to their prices that they were at. Let me try to find a chart that goes all the way back to 2000 and see what I can see there. But I think that's just kind of interesting. And, you know, people might say, oh, it's not a good company because of that. But as long as you buy it at a good valuation, um, you know, you should be fine, right? Um, yeah, I think Zoom is uh an interesting company like there's definitely a lot of potential and usefulness in their technology um one thing for sure is it's kind of like a single product company right like zoom the 
video chatting software is basically like their only thing, their only big thing, right? At least to my knowledge. Um, whereas something like Cisco, they have a lot else going on just, you know, aside from WebEx, right? You know, Microsoft, they have a lot going on in their company aside from Microsoft Teams. So it's not like they are just like depending on this one service, whereas Zoom is just kind of depending on this one uh, software offering. That's, you know, their Zoom uh, video communication, basically. So I think that is maybe a little bit concerning in that regard, but I think that's at the same time, it's not like there's plenty of companies that don't have a ton of products, but I think that could help them if they're able to like create some other products um, and services and softwares outside of their video communications softwares. Like I think that would be very valuable for them. So basically their high was in October, 2020 at 588 and they're trading at 115 now. So honestly, like I feel like the 115 price, it's like fairly decent now to be honest. But again, like I would classify zoom as like a quote unquote pandemic stock. And so in that case, I just want to stay away from that, you know, because um, they've definitely not um, seen as much. They've not seen um, continued uh, recovery from the pandemic and like most companies, right? They suffered from the pandemic, which was a, something that was bad for um, lots of people, right? And uh, then once the overall economy got better, those companies got better, right? Um, and their results improved and they're posting better results, right? Whereas with Zoom, it's kind of the opposite. It's like they excelled during the pandemic and then now that that's waning down and there's less um, issues going on with that, then they are not doing as well right now. Or at least they're not doing as well as they are before. Um, I will say like, the pandemic definitely accelerated their growth. Like they're not going to lose everything that they gained from the pandemic for sure. Um, it definitely accelerated accelerated their growth to some extent. Um, but it's not like they're going to maintain all of that for sure is what I would say. Okay, Jonathan, uh, I think I will let you get to your dinner. I hope that goes well for you. Um, I know I would certainly be hungry right now if I hadn't eat dinner, eaten dinner yet, uh, but I guess that's another problem. Let's see, what are the other companies? You know, one company I really like is Lockheed Martin, but it's just not, you know, it's not where I want it to be in order to own more of it. Um, I was really buying a lot, you know, in the, you know, lower half of the 300s like below 350 i was all over lockheed martin but um you know these prices just aren't as great um i would say not great at all to be honest um but you know that's okay uh, i think there's going to be times when they're having higher prices and times when there's going to be lower prices so uh like if we look here back in september you know they were at like 330 335 um, and then back in, this is actually very interesting. They, um, they beat earnings by, I don't know, like they beat earnings by like 10% of what was expected. And then after that, they dropped, you know, from like 375 to like 325. Um, and I think I bought more around that 325 level as well. So Lockheed Martin, definitely a company I'm a fan of. Um, but again, just not the best prices right now. Mm. And, um, you know, like I said, there's always different opportunities in the market. So um, I will look for other opportunities outside of Lockheed Martin. So um, let's see. What else have I been looking at? Uh, Southern Company, definitely not been looking at that. That's way, way too pricey for me. Um, and I think I'm pretty happy with it in my portfolio at this moment. Travelers. Um, definitely too pricey for me at this point. Um, you know, a company I want to own more of is Johnson & Johnson. Um, I really want to own more of Johnson & Johnson, but I just 
don't really feel like it's at a great price right now, to be honest. Um, Apple, I think it's Apple's at a fairly decent price. Um, I bought some below 140 recently, which I was pretty happy with. But, you know, Apple is a, it's a premium company, so you're not going to get great discounts very often, I don't think. So um, you got to take advantage of it when you can. You got to, you know, buy some here and there when you can. And, uh, yeah, just hope for the best with that. Like, I would love to see uh, Apple at, like, um, $100 a share or something. Jake, my largest positions are Microsoft, CVS, and Google. Um, I don't know much about CVS, to be honest. Um, obviously, I see them all around, so they must be doing something right, but... Um, I guess the thing there is it's more of a, you know, they're a retailer, but they do also offer like pharmacy products, which I think is good. Um, I think what, well, I don't know. I don't know enough about it, I guess, to say much, but wow. Very interesting. Like from 2015 to like 2020, they were just kind of like, doing crappy to be honest and then recently they since 2020 they've had huge rallies definitely have loved to bought it have bought it in the 50s like that's amazing um but yep i don't know much about cvs 15 pe which is pretty solid i would say forward pe of 10 um i guess the one thing i don't really like a ton over the past five years earnings has only grown about four percent but i guess um Based on these numbers, that's expected to increase 8.8% earnings growth this year, expected 7 next year, and 6 over the next 5 years. So um, I think that's not bad. Oh, okay. So it owns Aetna. I did not, I did not know about Aetna. Yeah. Uh, I guess if it's an insurance company, that's actually pretty interesting that they can kind of do that. I, I like that diversified nature, I guess. Um, one of the things I was talking about, um, recently, I guess, I think in one of my videos, um, I think it was a video I made on IBM was about acquisitions. And, um, sometimes, you know, I just feel like if companies are making a lot of acquisitions, that's like not necessarily a good thing because it might be hard to like integrate all those companies together. Um, but I think, you know, if you make strategic acquisitions, uh, that can definitely work. Um, and for CVS, you know, like I said, I don't know much about them, but I think that um, acquisition of Edna was probably, it's like a decent idea because it can diversify your revenue outside of like traditional pharmaceutical products and uh, services and uh, generic retail stuff. Um, so I guess health insurance is probably more of like a, if I had to guess, I would say it's maybe more of a stable business with um, predictable income, I guess. But yeah, like I said, I don't know much about it, but that's very interesting. Uh, maybe I will look into it at some point, um, do a little stock analysis on it. That'd be cool. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I do appreciate that. And I'll definitely look at it in more depth at some point. I guess what I would be interested to see is what Yahoo Finance says about it. Let's see, CBS. Yeah, see like, uh, I guess, I guess I don't think of CBS as like a healthcare company as much. Obviously, if they have, like, Aetna, it's an insurance healthcare company. Um, but from my perspective, I would think of CVS as more of, like, just, like, a retailer, you know? Obviously, they're going to they have, like, the pharmacy and stuff. But I don't know. Maybe the pharmacy is a bigger part of their business than I would have guessed. Um, just goes to show I'm not very educated on CVS. But, um, yeah, I think that could be interesting play there. Uh, let's see. So yeah, 
I guess if they acquired Aetna, that could be uh, a good play to increase their earnings. Like I was saying, like the earnings over the past few years like have not been stellar from what I see in terms of growth. I mean, at least they've been growing. That's better than not. Um, but maybe that Aetna stuff is part of it. And, you know, as they are able to uh, take advantage of more of a long-term approach there, um, they're able to capitalize on some of that. Obviously, over time, you're going to gain efficiencies within your acquisitions. Um, like initially, you're not going to have you're not going to be super. Whatever company you acquire isn't going to be like the most efficient and integrated, so it's going to take some time to get there. And that's kind of one of the things that like is not uh, super appealing about tons of acquisitions is like those are constantly having to be integrated into your own business. And obviously, it's not like they're all. Um, same company and they're still going to be sort of like subsidiaries and sort of doing their own thing but they have to be able to work together and I guess the value of acquisitions is really when you can take separate pieces and make the sum of them greater than the individual sums if that makes sense so uh, yeah synergies is uh the technical word for that I guess which um you know it's a good word I like it but um yeah, in terms of Microsoft, I guess I talked a little bit about Microsoft. I think it's a great company. I recently bought a little bit more just because I wanted to own more, but I don't think it's at the best valuation right now. In terms of Google, I think Google is at a fairly decent price at this point. And, you know, their revenue, their revenue just keeps growing so quickly, man. Um, that's crazy. I mean, there was at 3,000 just back in February and then down to basically 2,000 towards the end of May, so, yeah, like I was saying, pretty good price, I mean, that's down, like, 33%, uh, their earnings, I did see they, uh, didn't meet ALS expectations in, uh, for the first quarter earnings, but I didn't really look at them that closely, uh, as to, you know, why they were lower, or what their justification for that was, so, I should probably do that at some point, because, uh, I think that's, I always like to see what the companies say um, sort of as justification like if you know their earnings were lower or if they were lower than expected or something like that usually they have something to say about why that was usually I mean they usually have something to say either way about why whatever happened happened you know so um, I definitely need to look into that more So I think that's probably going to be about it for the live stream. Um, I think that's sort of what I wanted to talk about for the most part. I think um, my overall my overall thoughts is I don't think we're going to be, you know, going back to all-time highs for sure within like a year probably. I think it's going to take a little bit more time until we get some of this more macroeconomic stuff sorted out, you know, like inflation. Um, see where the rate hikes take us, you know, see where that goes. And stuff like uh, the manufacturing index is, I think it's pretty important. I forget what the actual name of it is, but um, that, I know like the last month reporting of that, um, it was still above 50, which is um, ISM manufacturing index. So it was, you know, the last reported uh, number was still above 50, which is basically means a positive sign, but it was like decreasing, um, which is not great to see. So uh, I think that that's another like interesting thing to look at in terms of how the overall economy goes. And like I said, I don't know a ton about um, the economy, so I, I really can't talk on that. But, you know, like I said, I think it's it's going to take a little bit of time for sure. And, uh, you know, I'm fine to ride it out and keep investing in these companies long term. and. Uh, you know, take care of opportunity, take advantage of opportunities when I can. So, uh, thanks everyone for coming, coming on Jake, Bill. Um, it was good hearing your thoughts and, uh, expanding my knowledge on some of these companies as, uh, like, you know, like I was saying earlier, like companies I don't own, um, I don't really know much about, and I want to get more knowledgeable about, um, companies that I don't own so that 
if there is an opportunity, I can take advantage of it and not have to do a ton of research. And then by the time I do that, the opportunity is gone. I want to be able to jump on the opportunity when I can. So uh, that's something I'm definitely going to be working on. So uh, thanks for coming around. Um, hopefully I'm going to have another guest on within the next few, few weeks um, to talk about some uh, their investments. Um, one of the next few should be pretty interesting, I think. Um, I think he has a pretty different investing strategy. Well, not not all that different, but um, I guess my perception of his investing strategy is that it's very like rigid um, and not very, maybe not flexible, but um, maybe not the most open to new ideas, I guess, um, which, you know, in some respects is a good and bad thing. If you're confident in what you're doing, that's good. But um, I'll let you guys wait for that and see, see who that is when the time comes. So uh, again, thanks for sticking around and I will see you guys in the next video this Saturday and uh, in the next live stream within a week or two. Thanks. Bye.